was uh, from here, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I uh, I don't have to say I'm, I'm uh, very very happy to be back in in Madison. I, it was the, the seven years of my life which I will never forget. It was a great time here, with great colleagues um, and wonderful students. I mean, only last week uh, uh, Lane Kenworthy gave a lecture at the uh, New York University, and, and I'm I'm at the uh, New School right now in New York. So I just had to take the subway two stops and I could hear. A wonderful lecture from Lane. So, so, and they are all over the place. Um, I, uh, uh, I've recently worked, as um, uh, Eric has said, on uh, mature, advanced uh, capitalist societies, modern societies, if you want, uh, and uh, their uh, capitalist uh, the, uh, economy plus society and what has happened to them recently and what is uh, probably happening to them in the future. Uh, for a while I was, uh, I emphasized in my work what came to be called the varieties of capitalism, that is the differences between different capitalist countries. In recent years I became increasingly interested in the commonalities and uh, both the endogenous co commonalities uh, what they have in common in terms of their uh, developmental di dynamics and their interdependence with the United States as, uh, uh, as a center still uh, of this uh, world that we could uh, briefly call o OECD capitalism. Um, during this work, I uh, became convinced that subjects as, as those that I'm, I'm interested in can be and should best be discussed uh, as elements of a historical sequence. Uh, by historical sequence I mean uh, located in time and place. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, to me uh, the enlightening, the most enlightening experience in the last ten years was when I uh, began to look at certain phenomena like uh, public uh, debt, uh, uh, un unemployment, uh, growth rates, and uh, looked at them in, uh, uh, in segments, in, in, in terms of historical trajectories. Uh, the moment you do this, you begin to see commonalities between uh, nations, countries, that you didn't see if you just took a, a cross edge cross sections they are different but if you look at uh, their their uh, you could you could say their developmental trajectory uh, often you see that uh, uh, some countries sort of follow in a distance of about 10 15 years but but in 10 years they are basically there where the uh, most let's say liberal or whatever country was so what we did was look look at these uh, time series sequences uh, in different countries, and then my interest became in understanding uh, uh, the common dynamics behind these curves uh, over time. Um, and as I said, uh, if you do this, uh, the differences are not so uh, uh, amazing. What is amazing is that they seem to behave in much the same way. Um, uh, the, if, if I say historical, then the question is where do these historical trajectories begin? That is, where do you make the cut? And if you talk to historians, they will always tell you, well, you can't really make a cut uh, because everything has a history, and, and that history also has, has a prehistory. Uh, but, of course, as sociologists, we have to uh, identify the, uh, uh, the, the data points. And I came to uh, to believe that, uh, with many others, uh, that, that there is a fundamental breaking point in the history of the post-war world, which is somewhere in the 1970s. And, and as a, a general concept, I, I refer to this as the breakup of the post-war settlement. So we're not talking long durée, but uh, intermediate durée, so to speak. Yeah? Uh, and, and this time period from the 1970s to today, you can also say, uh, as, as a sort of global 
uh, process of uh, liberalization of, of advanced capitalist political economies uh, has become my, uh, uh, my uh, main focus in recent years. Uh, and there, of course, the interesting, the, the fundamental question that is always in the center is the relationship between economy and polity, between markets and states, uh, and then between uh, uh, capitalism and democracy. Uh, much of my work in recent years then began with a focus on institutional change and on gradual institutional change. Uh, how uh, do we understand the dynamics that underlie uh, gradual processes of fundamental change that we don't recognize immediately, but that all the time we see that something has accumulated, and it has accumulated following the logic, not, uh, uh, not contingently. It, it is something that is uh, alive in, in different places uh, in much the same way. So that was uh, my, in, in 2009, uh, I, I published a book uh, written before the, the crisis uh, on, uh, on the German political economy and its, uh, uh, its, its, its change in different institutional sectors uh, titled Reforming Capitalism with a, with a hyphen between re and forming. And, and that's actually what the, what the book shows, how different subsectors of this society seem to move all in the same direction, reinforcing each other, uh, uh, interacting with each other in some way, but moving this whole political slowly, gradually, uh, sometimes imperceptibly, in a direction that um, in the old varieties of capitalism literature used to be roughly and crudely described as a, a liberal, a liberal market uh, e e economy. The others were moving also, so uh, distances w remained basically the same, but the trend was the interesting thing. And then, of course, after 2008, I became also interested in events, not just sequences, but also events, chain, uh, and, and this, this 2008 event, which was so such a global um, um, the phenomenon that uh, the moment uh, the, the American housing market crashed, uh, the German government began to rescue the German banks, and, and this is a, this was really something that that I I, I think we really need to understand. Uh, I will, in this framework, say something today and uh, tomorrow. Um, the uh, and and I will now briefly uh, introduce the subject that I'm going to talk about today, that is uh, uh, public finance. Uh, I'm not an economist and not a specialist in public finance. I hit on this as someone who uh, basically initially worked on labor relations uh, and, and social, uh, social policy. Um, in Germany in the 19, uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, uh, there was much pressure for uh, reforms of the labor market, labor market regime. Uh, as it, I, I want to 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 repeat the, uh, the the diagnosis of the time, but um, the what 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 I found extremely um, so sort of challenging in this context was that when I became a little bit involved in the policy making process, we suggested that uh, uh, part of the costs of the social secure of the social security system uh, and of the labor market policy system should be shifted from contributions to taxes uh, it, that would have been um, a relief for uh, the uh, labor cost uh, a problem uh, and it would have been a more sort of egalitarian distribution of the costs of our welfare state uh, because uh, taxpayers, there are more taxpayers than contribution payers. And, and then we began to look at the, at the figures, and to my great surprise, uh, I began to see that uh, already one half or more than one half of the welfare state was actually paid out of general taxes, and that there was an enormous uh, resistance on the part of everyone who knew the books to add additional, uh, additional expenses to, uh, to the uh, federal um, uh, budget. Um, so uh, uh, 
it, that to me was uh, was a first uh, indication of the importance of fiscal constraints and fiscal considerations uh, in uh, a political economy that had not really uh, often thought about this. Um, so, yeah, then from there to the fiscal crisis, I began to uh, to look into what uh, in the 1920s. After the First World War, was a beginning a beginning discipline in German sociology called fiscal sociology. Uh, one of the founders of it was uh, this great economist plus sociologist Joseph Schumpeter, uh, Schumpeter who uh, uh, in in 1918, uh, looking at the uh, totally uh, corrupted finances of the Austrian Empire former Austrian Empire, which was disintegrating, that began to speculate about the future of the tax state. And in this uh, famous essay about the tax state, he suggests that uh, the public, I will read this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this quote later, that, that the public budget could be taken as a set of indicators on the condition, on the relationship between uh, the economy and the polity, or between society, society and the economy. Uh, it was, would all be reflected in the public uh, budget if one understood this correctly. Now, he was uh, to become Austrian finance minister at the time, at, at a very young age, but the, the, the finances were uh, were corrupted anyway, so so it didn't much matter who was the finance minister, and and then he became the chief of a bank, and and the bank went bankrupt. And, and so so after which he he was so indebted. That is the subject that that comes up. That he had to go to the United States and write one book after the other in order to pay off his to pay off his debt. So the, there was a long discussion in Germany and in, in German Austrian sociology at the time on this. Uh, and, and I would like to, uh, to at least mention a few of the leading figures there. In the background of all of this is a man named Adolf Wagner, uh, the, who was probably one of the most unpleasant uh, characters of, of his time. Uh, Max Weber hated him, but Weber also then hated everybody else also. Uh, he, uh, he wrote fantastically fat books, one after the other, uh, and you have to sort of read them carefully, but there's something in there uh, which uh, later became sort of distilled into uh, what economists at the time called the uh, Wagner's Law. And Wagner's Law was this uh, assumption that he spelled out in different contexts that public uh, spending uh, the share of the state in the economy was about to grow over time as, and then, and then he sort of uh, fiddled around with a, with a good uh, model why this should be the case. Ultimately, it comes down to uh, civilizational improvement, uh, the progress of society. Yeah? The more progressive a society would be, uh, the more uh, the, the, the socialized, uh, it, uh, its, uh, its economy would have to become because more and more tasks became so uh, uh, demanding uh, on the polity that they could not no longer be left uh, to private uh, uh, provision. So uh, th this was the idea of a permanently growing public sector together with the level of civilization of a society. Now, Wagner was a deeply conservative character. But much of this reminds you of Marx's uh, assumption uh, that uh, there was, in, in as uh, industry uh, societies uh, grew and developed, there would be an increasing socialization of production inside private uh, means and inside private ownership of the means of production colliding with it. Uh, uh, Wagner never, never went that far, but if you, if you think about this uh, uh, logically, then there would have been a point where uh, and, uh, the society, uh, the, let's say where the public sector grew to a point 
that it would begin to crowd out the private sector. Now you could uh, like this, Marx would have liked it, you could be uh, concerned about it, but this was a, an important theme. And at the time, a third person I would like to mention, uh, a contemporary of Schumpeter and, uh, and Weber, Rudolf Goldscheid, an Austrian uh, a sociologist plus uh, economist, very interesting character who was who was uh, unendingly rich because his family, uh, he was <laughs> born with a golden spoon in the mouth, so to speak. He, he never had to have a, a chair at the university because, because he, he lived for his own income. Gottschalk was a, was a socialist, a radical socialist, uh, whom uh, Max Weber also hated. <laughs> and and Gottschalk developed this, this model. Weber actually left the German Sociological Association because he hated this guy Gottschalk so much after he had founded the German Sociological Association. So, so this, this Gottschalk theory is, is essentially uh, driving the Wagner thing to the, to the end. Goldscheid argues with Schumpeter that at some stage the common needs of a society will no longer be able to be funded out of taxes extracted uh, by the public sector from private owners, that this model would run out. And that at some stage, as Schumpeter says in the 1918 lecture at the end, uh, once we will have reached a more civilized way of life, without uh, competition for profit and all of this, then finally we will, say Schumpeter, then finally we will have socialism and the tax state will have disappeared and it will sort of become a social uh, state. Oh, okay, so, so that's an interesting setup. In the, in the coming years, uh, after, after the 1920s, we had inflation, uh, war and all of this, and uh, so this thing was forgotten, partly because you couldn't really use uh, uh, the, the, the public accounts anymore uh, after they had been uh, upset by First World War, Second World War, and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, in the, then, however, in the 1970s, uh, a new debate on this begins. And uh, uh, there's two people who, who are important in bringing up again this question of the fiscal sociology and of the relationship between uh, the, the resources that uh, the public sector, the state, can extract from the privately owned uh, uh, economy and whether this is enough, the fiscal crisis of the state. James O'Connor, Marxist American, at the, uh, in the late 1960s, sort of was one of the first to rediscover the, the, the Bolscheid, Schumpeter, Albert Wagner uh, subject and uh, uh, write this uh, very difficult to read book, uh, <laughs> The Fiscal Crisis. It is like very messy sometimes, but it's full of good ideas. Uh, there he sort of uh, predicts that uh, uh, a fiscal crisis of the state was about to happen. Uh, why? Uh, not very systematic. There is uh, a need in a capitalist economy to damage the repair, to, to, to repair the damage that the capitalist mode of production inflicts on a society. Yeah. So that's, a, that's an old Marxian uh, lef leftist theme, very uh, um, pertinent today uh, if you look at um, uh, environmental consequences. Uh, then social pacification in a democracy then uh, the need for a general infrastructure uh, that would underpin uh, uh, capitalist uh, uh, production. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, uh, the generally the management of the relationship with uh, the working class. It's very interesting that, um, that he, he basically says uh, this, yeah, and then the government workers, so, so he has a very <laughs> a very strong view that in the United States, uh, state workers would all get organized, and and then they would extract more and more wages from the from the state, and as a result, the state could would not pay for it. It's like he had the teachers' union in in New York in in mind, at least the way in which it is described by its enemies. Uh, but but that that wasn't uh, to to happen. But it is interesting that that one of the first two. Uh, 
uh, to notice this, uh, this new development in, in state theory and in political economy was Daniel Bell. Daniel Bell, who always uh, sort of knew what was coming uh, and, and was able to write a good essay on just about anything, uh, he picks this up and, and he says, look, um, uh, even from my own perspective, I can see that with the tax state arrangement that we have, there is something wrong. Uh, and there is a critical tension here uh, between the consumer, the society of consumers and capitalist producers on the one hand, and the infrastructural needs of this society, and the demands that people make on the state for social security and all of this. How will, is this going to be funded? And, and he concurs with, uh, uh, with uh, O'Connor that uh, something uh, was in the offing. What, what was it? Uh, as I said, this, this begins in the 1970s. And what I'm going to do now is I will show you uh, how this tension sort of begins to creep into uh, the political economies of advance. Uh, capitalism. Uh, this graph begins in 1970, and you see that um, uh, at this time, roughly on average, 40% of the gross domestic product uh, of OECD countries, here we have the 12 most important ones, looks, places like Luxembourg, we, we don't include them. They have probably the uh, the size of, of Madison, Wisconsin, 500,000. Um, uh, and you see that uh, there is a pretty uh, impressive increase uh, from 40% uh, then to 2008. There's a sort of bend in, in, in the 1990s. Uh, and then it goes up even more. And now it's so roughly doubled, if not more. And there's no end in sight. Now, whatever that means, um, as I said, average indebtedness more than doubled in the roughly four decades between the 1970s and 2010. As pointed out, um, rising public debt was a general phenomenon in almost all countries of democratic uh, capitalism. Differences between countries did exist, but in a longitudinal perspective, they reduce mostly to time lags and appear of minor significance compared to the universal nature of the process. Note that the rise of indebtedness was halted in the mid-1990s for about a decade to resume only in 2008, the first year of an apparently never-ending financial crisis when state indebtedness started its steepest incline uh, of the period uh, uh, under observation. I, I return to this uh, later. Yes, the, what this is actually is clear. It is the, the taking over of the private debt of the financial sector by the public. Um, now, uh, economic institutionalist theories in the tradition of writers like James Buchanan attribute the increase in public debt since the 1970s to an inherent tendency of political democracy to overspend, caused by short-sightedness of voters and opportunism of, of politicians. Buchanan all over the place. Where, where public choice transmutes into a theory of democratic failure, the claim is that public deficits and public debt are due to majoritarian electoral pressure from below for redistribution through public spending. In the following, I will argue that this account, based on highly stylized hypothetical assumptions on rational behavior under democratic conditions, appears highly implausible when the increase in public debt is placed in the context of other events and developments that happened in the OECD world during the same period. This is what I'm going to do now. This is because the growth of public sector was accompanied by a steady decline in both democratic mobilization and the distribution of position of mass publics, pointing to a secular contraction of the power resources and redistributive capacities of the very democratic politics 
that are held responsible by theories of public choice for the rise in public indebtedness since the 1970s. So the implicit point is there must be some other reason. As to democratic power resources, and, and now what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm uh, looking at this curve in the context of other curves. Uh, participation in national elections in the OECD world peaked in the 1960s when it was as high as 84% uh, on average for 22 countries. From there, it dropped continuously from decade to decade and reached 73% in the 11 years from 2000 to 2011. Now, it is clear that um, if you present this to an American audience, you would say, oh my god, 73%, that's pretty good. Uh, but, but again, uh, even the countries with low uh, turnout get lower turnout during this time. And, and the countries with high turnout get also lower turnout. So there's not a single country where this goes in the other direction. And that's the important uh, story. The, the, the variation coefficients between, uh, between countries are basically uh, not very high. Uh, and, and, and especially over time, there's no increasing spread. They, they all go in the same direction. Um, so, um, uh, a third form, uh, yeah, th th that was that. Uh, unionization, another form of political participation, attained its highest post war level in the 1970s and then began to fall everywhere. So, uh, um, on, on this count, O'Connor was not right. <laughs> it was, for, this is for six countries only, incidentally, because if I put in Sweden, then we would have to sort of compress the axis and I wouldn't see anything anymore. They, they started at 90%. And they were 90% all the time until 1995. Bang! They are now exactly. Yeah. So even Sweet <coughs> joins the club as a sort of latecomer. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing about these curves, that uh, they are holdouts, but they, they, they don't survive forever. A, a third form of mass political participation Industrial action, as the English call it, also known as strikes, you can also industrial inaction, practically ended in the 1980s. Uh, here I omit Italy on my seven model countries, because in Italy <laughs> you would also have to start up there. <laughs> you see it there. But at least now here. Yeah. Uh, the decay of popular participation in redistributive politics was associated with a continuous loss in the distribution position of popular majorities. Unemployment increased everywhere as governments withdrew from the post-war promise of politically guaranteed full employment. Today, unemployment rates between 5 and 10 percent are considered normal in capitalist democracies. Here we are. This, these are five-year sliding averages, so you, so you can sort of see, uh, see it better. But what you see is, this is where it is here, and this is where it is here. It's a lot more. And, and uh, uh, even Sweden now, uh, even Sweden, the classical country of full employment labor market policy, has since the end of the 1990s been content with a natural level of unemployment hovering between 6 and 9%. In, in parallel, Income inequality has steadily increased in most countries until the middle of the first decade of the 2000s. One factor behind this was a massive decline of the wage share almost everywhere, caused by a lasting decoupling of wage increases from increases in productivity. Not surprisingly, most pronounced in the United States, where by the end of the 1970s, average hourly earnings ceased to follow productivity. That's something that you know. Uh, that, that you know very well. Uh, Tom Corcoran, uh, the breaking of the post-war social contract. Summing up, the rise of public debt, the arrival of what I call the debt state out of the tax state, uh, took place alongside the neoliberal revolution in the post-war political economy. At the time when democratic redistributive intervention in capitalist markets became ineffective on many fronts, Increasing public debt is unlikely to be explained by excessive democratic power on the part of voters and workers. In fact, rather than electorates 
extracting unearned incomes from the economy, growing government indebtedness in OECD nations was accompanied by a lasting decline in the distributional position of popular majorities, which in turn was associated with a secular decay of the power resources of redistributive democracy. Now that is really interesting because it's the opposite of the public choice explanation of, of, this, of this curve. Now, before I go on, I want to say something on, uh, on, on public debt uh, because I now live in the United States and there is this crewman thing in the background. Where, my God, yeah, <laughs> what is public debt? Let's, uh, let's, do, let's do it as, as much as we can. Now, the helicopter, this is sort of Keynes and the helicopter, helicopter money thing. Uh, Keynes in the, in the Depression suggested that uh, uh, money, my God! Yeah, let's print money. We we uh, take a helicopter and then we then we uh, sort of drop it off of the helicopter. And everybody takes it, and the economy goes goes back. And 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 that is a great solution to uh, to problems. Now now the curve that I showed, the, the problem with this curve is that it goes up and up and up and up. Uh, old Keynes would have been quite surprised about this because in his view. Uh, the, the, the debt would have been sort of paid off at some stage, and then it would uh, be used again uh, as a as a stimulus. Yeah? You can't have total stimulus if, if you have stimulus all the time. You get addicted. Uh, that, that's probably what what it is. Now, now that, that's one thing, uh, and and quite apart from the discussion of uh, how useful this is and, and so on, uh, there's also the problem of over indebtedness which plays itself out in countries outside the United States in different ways from the United States. One cannot be, one cannot be more uh, uh, clear about this. The United States basically indebts itself in its own currency, whereas other countries cannot do this. Uh, so other countries always um, think about the point where uh, they have so much debt to pay off, uh, uh, debt overhang, that nobody will lend the money anymore. <laughs> Or that interest rates get 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 up. I will say something about interest rates later. Uh, oh, okay. So so it's a real problem, uh, not just the problem of the Tea Party. So to speak. Yeah, the Tea Party is against public debt, but the so public debt can be very useful. But 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 if it sort of goes on and on and on and on all the time, and in all countries at the same time, there's something there that needs to be explained. Okay, to account for the increase in, and, and now I will uh, give you my explanation of this uh, in a sort of more first historically grounded approach and then a more uh, political economy approach. Uh, and I hope that uh, Eric will allow me to go maybe 10 minutes longer. I, know I, I allow you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to account for the increase in, in government debt across a wide range of countries over an extended period of time, it seems useful. Uh, to draw on the distinction between proximate and ultimate causes. The parallel buildup of debt in capitalist democracies was, was produced by a variety of specific factors, but often interrelated, differed between countries and over time. All of these proximate causes, however, point back to one common ultimate cause, a secular decline in economic growth in the democratic capitalist OECD world. Seen from this perspective, the accumulation of public debt since the 1970s appears as part of a variegated response of countries and actors to declining growth and to the pressures on the politics of rich capitalist democracies that resulted and result from it. Following incomplete list, and, and uh, declining growth has enormous distributional consequences, as you see here. Uh, and in fact, the, the recent book by Thomas P Piketty on, on capitalism in the 21st century is actually about the same phenomenon. Since the 1970s, inequality increases uh, while uh, uh, productivity uh, grows decline. Uh, and the, the power of politics over the economy declines. First, public debt began to increase in the mid-1970s, and in particular in the early 1980s, as a result of an OECD-wide recession, which activated automatic fiscal stabilizers, and in some countries called forth Keynesian economic spending. The second oil crisis caused higher expenses on unemployment benefit and active labor market policy. Same was true for the contraction of employment 
following the deflationary monetary policy of the U.S. Central Bank under Walker in 1979, with interest rates at times exceeding 20%, and the British turn to monetarism under Margaret Thatcher. Generally, the revocation of the post-war com commitment to politically guaranteed full employment, a commitment that had begun to cause high and rising inflation at the end of post-war growth, and the acceptance on the part of governments of a residual level of unemployment as a natural condition was bound to put pressure on public finance as long as retrenchment of the post-war welfare state had not yet been accomplished. And if you look at the curves, you see that in the 1980s, the welfare state expenditure goes up, and then you begin to see reform, reform, reform. The, so taking back the guarantees that, that, that existed before. So the end of the second point, the end of both growth and inflation led to a sharp increase in tax resistance, first in the United States, California, and then elsewhere in the OECD world. In response, several countries passed tax reforms to eliminate what is called bracket creep, the movement of taxpayers into higher income tax rates. That's an essential issue of the sort of uh, Goldscheid, uh, uh, Schumpeter, uh, Wagner problem, uh, how much can uh, the democratic state take out of the economy to appropriate for the collectivity? And, and how much can people resist? Uh, uh, what means do people have to resist this? And, and it turns out that in a democracy you have a lot of means to do this, uh, and in an open economy uh, even more. Uh, emblematic for this was the tax reform during Ronald Reagan's first period of office, which together with deflation and an unprecedented arms buildup, was instrumental in causing the most dramatic rise in government debt since the Second World War. And this man Stockman has written his memoirs about this. While, while tax revenue had until the mid-1970s by and large kept pace with public spending, by the late 1980s it began to stagnate until it started declining after the end of the century. Now, now this, this is the uh, this is tax revenue. And, and you see that this curve sort of goes very on a very nice rise together with public expansion. But then it flattens. And it flattens first. And the period of consolidation in the 1990s is essentially an attempt to bring public spending back to a more or less frozen level of taxation. And that is also something that you can, uh, you observe this in almost all of these countries. These averages do not hide much variation. Yeah. Um, so this is total tax revenue selected the same countries, 1970 to 2000, and you see that roughly in the 1990s. It sort of hits the nadir, and then it begins to go down. Yeah. And, and this is precisely the period where we talk about globalization and, um, and the finance, financial, financial sector that is internationally integrated and, and all these things. So, so here is the real hard restriction for the growth of, uh, of public uh, spending. Third point, the 1990s were a time when OECD nations managed to bring down public spending in an effort to match it to stagnant and indeed declining tax revenue, as seen in figure eight. In part, this was made easier by the end of the communist bloc and the peace dividend. It, 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 <clears throat> but it was also due to deep reforms of welfare state institutions. It seems reasonable to consider welfare state reform as a time length response to the rise in public spending after the end of politically guaranteed unemployment plus the declining taxability of these, of these economies. Both these things come together. Uh, retrenchment of social protection was champ championed by Clinton administration, as, as we know. Germany welfare reform was delayed by unification as the West German social policy regime was translated one-to-one -to, -one to the new lender. A decade later, however, Schroeder government passed the so-called arts fear legislation. Depending on the country, where, and, and that was what, what I could have, could have observed close up, and I mentioned at, at the outset, 
this uh, welfare state was not about uh, full employment or labor or labor market. It, it was about public finance. Uh, it was simply that uh, uh, the amount of the, that, that, that welfare state began to cost uh, exceeded what the state could extract from its economic base to pay for it. Yeah. That, that was that was the uh, 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 what, what happened. Depending on the country, welfare state reforms did not always necessarily result in lower aggregate spending, at least not immediately. It did, however, cut individual entitlements in reaction to rising numbers of long-term unemployed and other recipients of social assistance. The 1990s, which might be described as a first period of fiscal consolidation, uh, shows that mass democracies, if placed under enough economic pressure and with voters sufficiently demobilized, and taxpayers sufficiently well organized to escape taxation are quite capable of curtailing social protection and generally imposing economic hardship on the majority of voters in the interest of what is called sound finance. So Buchanan uh, doesn't really apply here. Uh, point four, by the late 1990s, a country like the United States had achieved a budget surplus. This did not last long, however, as it was soon to be wiped out after 2001 by deep tax cuts combined with a steep increase in military spending, very much on the model of the first Reagan administration. Given that the Bush tax cuts, as they came to be called, overwhelmingly benefited corporations and the very rich, they cannot possibly be attributed to an excess of redistributive democracy or inverse democracy. Well, quite to the contrary, the restored public deficit was used as an, and not just in the United States, but worldwide, as an argument for further cuts in public expenditure, as military spending was untouchable and higher taxes on high incomes politically infeasible. Current debates on balancing the U.S. federal budget focus exclusively on the so-called entitlements and on the spending side, not on the revenue. Um, and of course, you, you're, you're very, very familiar with this uh, sort of starving the beast strategy, global Norquist, and so on. Don't have to mention this. Uh, five, the fiscal crisis of 2008 caused the greatest hike in public indebtedness ever due to the immense costs of both the rescue of the financial system and the stimulus spending required for keeping national economies from collapsing. And here again, we, we see this strange uh, uh, way in which public finance and, this, and the condition of the private economy are interlinked. We, we go from one facet to, to the next. It's, it's very interesting how they, uh, how they influence each other. Uh, okay, this just as, as an illustration how, how much the, the crisis, what the crisis did to public finance. Like tax cuts for the rich, like Star Wars and the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, the absorption after 2008 of unsustainable private debt by the state as a debtor of last resort after 2008 cannot be attributed to irresponsible greed among voters and politicians. The emergency measures taken in 2008 wiped out all of the publicly very, politically very costly accomplishments of the consolidation efforts of the 1990s and restored the level of public debt to the trend line for the 40-year period beginning in the mid-1970s. Contrary to public choice theory, the most dramatic leap in public indebtedness since the 1970s was the case of failure, not of, of failure, not of democracy, but of capitalism, in particular in the new form of financial capitalism. How are the various proximate causes of the fiscal crisis of which democracy is related. The common cause, I suggest, behind the proximate causes effective along the trajectory of the public debt build up was the declining growth performance of the OECD world. Um, after 1974, average real growth per year in OECD countries over five periods fluctuated between 2 and 3 percent, apart from two peaks at the end of the 1980s and the 1990s, when it rose to, and these peaks now, now this great uh, uh, e e economist Larry Summers goes to the IMF and tells us, well, basically these were bubbles. <laughs>
uh, in, in, in the early two, uh, 2000s. And the, the speech last year in uh, wherever they, they, they met, very messy said, yeah, it was a bubble and it wasn't real. Um, so um, thereafter, in the one and a half decades, since I, t 10 years before the Great Recession, average growth has declined almost steadily until they bottomed out at zero in 2010. In addition, with the end of inflation in the 1980s, the automatic devaluation of public debt ended as well. Moreover, low growth during, now, now they are, uh, now they, uh, you, you, you find them to, to espouse inflation again. Yeah, inflation is now the big thing. We have too little inflation, says Larry Summers, 2% uh, minimum we need, and Krugman says, well, let's have 4 or 5% inflation. Uh, be, because then we can wipe out the, the, the debt and we will have some, some growth again. So the, the fashions uh, uh, change very fast. Um, low growth during the same period resulted in average unemployment rates between 6 and 7%. After 1998, it also kept debt ratios uh, high, although budget deficits almost disappeared. So I will uh, uh, say something uh, to conclude. Uh, by uh, looking at the distributional side of uh, public debt, uh, public debt and social uh, inequality. The buildup of public debt since the 1970s was in complex ways connected to the increase in economic inequality that occurred at the same time. And this holds true also for the current politics of consolidation. I, I, I skipped that uh, section. As growth rates declined, and unemployment became endemic in the OECD world after the end of inflation, the wage and income spread increased, and so did public spending. Dwindling, uh, dwindling unionization and the withering away of the strike contributed their share to rising income inequality. Tax collection became more difficult due to growing resistance, and later also because of international tax competition in an increasingly open global economy. Public revenues fell as a result, further adding to public deficits and public debt. Distributional gains on the part of capital and of segments of the middle classes made possible by a growing low wage sector and less progressive taxation produced a savings overhang, Ben Bernanke, that was looking for safe investment opportunities. Tax reforms aimed at dissuading firms and high earners from exiting to less demanding jurisdictions uh, reformed, the, uh, it reinforced this, expanding both the demand and the supply of sovereign credit. In the 1990s at the latest, governments found it necessary to allow the financial industry to expand far beyond traditional limits, among other things by creating new credit instruments benefiting states, increasingly dependent on borrowing at, favor at favorable rates. Financialization in itself added to income inequality, both between sectors and within. The, now, states borrowing from their citizens instead of taxing them make another independent contribution to economic and social inequality. Owners of financial assets who can lend to the state what it would, would otherwise confiscate fiscals, uh, earn interest on what remains their capital. They may also leave their wealth to their offspring, especially where inheritance taxes have been cut or abolished for fear of taxpayer exit. A complementary effect, incidentally, is at work under privatized Keynesianism where liberalized credit serves to replace social assistance or supplement or to supplement low wages. The result is that the poor have to repay with interest if they take up credit was what would have been their wage or social benefit with better employment, stronger trade unions, and more public intervention. Moreover, as the debt state in its current form as a consolidation state reassures its creditors that their claims to public funds will take precedence over the claims of citizens. It essentially expropriates social rights and politically created entitlement intended to protect social cohesion. 
privatization of public services and the reduction of public social investment make for less egalitarian access to resources essential for equality of opportunity in an advanced knowledge society. If you want to know which country has the highest share of, uh, of uh, uh, students in, public, in, in private schools at the secondary level, you wouldn't believe it, it's Sweden. Sweden, after the, uh, uh, after the reforms, after the second economic, uh, the second uh, fiscal financial crisis in the mid 1990s, uh, where they have cut taxes ruthlessly down to a level where they are now at the French, at the French level. Yeah, it's of course that. And during this time, private schools, private kindergartens, all of this sort of begins to flourish. Uh, under the conservative government, and it is sort of very much locked in like the Thatcherian strategies in the 1980s, there's no prospect for a social democratic left wing coalition to reverse them. Um, um, the, so, moreover, as the debt state in its current form, as a consolidation state, reassures its creditors that their claims to public funds will take precedence over the claims of citizens. It essentially expropriates social rights. Uh, that, that, uh, so, <laughs> sorry, sorry I, I, I said that before. Uh, um, yeah, uh, so I want to show you one more diagram here, uh, also <coughs> leading to or two more, leading to the lecture tomorrow. Uh, this is the United States, but. But most countries follow roughly the same logic. Again, it puts these uh, crises in a separate and in the context. This is, this is the rate of inflation. And as we remember, some of you remember and others have read in the books, that the 1970s were a period of very high inflation rates in the United States, up to 14% a year. Uh, and then comes Walker, and that basically ends. Now Larry complains about too little inflation. But as inflation goes down, public debt goes up. It's like communicating pipes. Yeah. It is very interesting that if you look at other countries like Germany, which had a monetaristic uh, uh, policy due to the independence of its central bank in the 19, already then in the 1970s. Um, Germany had very low inflation, but in the 1970s, it had an early rise in public debt. So it's sort of uh, completely uh, exchangeable. <laughs> and, and then public debt, here, that, so this is public, United States, goes up here into the 1990s. Then comes Clinton and, and, uh, and the, the story about the deficit and consolidation. It goes on. But at this point, private debt really begins to explode. Yeah. And you see that in Germany too. Uh, that that uh, uh, in, or in, in a lot of other countries, especially Sweden, the, the consolidation of, uh, of the post-1995 crisis in public debt, Sweden is now down to a level, public debt level of about 40% of GDP. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, the private that level goes up uh, uh, in a completely complementary way. And, uh, um, and that's another way of putting uh, public debt in, in context. Uh, if you look at, if you add the four, it, it's questionable to what extent you can really add them. There, there have to be their overlaps in the, in the figures. It's very difficult to Pull, to pull them out, but it doesn't matter. Even if you do what you can, you add general government debt, the debt of non-financial corporations, the debt of households, and the debt of financial corporations, and you put them together, you see that that a sort of basic in the United States double uh, from 4.5 times the gross domestic product in 1970 to nine times the gross domestic product in 2010. And, uh, and that's something that, that you observe in all of these countries. 
sometimes you have this very strange thing that one of them doesn't really increase, but then the other one compensates for it. So that the, <laughs> that the sum basically moves like a, a straight line and the, and the, the uh, uh, basically at the same angle. Now, the, I'm, I'm, I'm showing this not to, uh, uh, not to make a big point. I'm, I'm not so sure what these things mean. Uh, and one can speculate about it. But it basically means, one thing is clear, that, that the public that, that everybody is so excited about uh, is only a small uh, share of the accumulated promises that keep these economies. That is basically a promise to, to do something in the future. The accumulated uh, promises that keep these economies going. Um, we will talk about this uh, thing tomorrow in the light of uh, what, what it means uh, for our understanding of the uh, general crisis of this system. Um, I, I end here, uh, and uh, there's, <laughs> there's more here, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure you will ask them in the, we will ask it in the, in the discussion. Okay, the floor is open for questions. I'll ask you one to yeah. start. Um, Giovanni Arrighi sits, yeah. argues that there are, in the long durée, episodes like this since the 15th century, basically. Yeah. That is, increasing fi financialization as opportunities for profitable capitalist investment become more difficult. Capitalists want to yeah. shift yeah. investment, and that state debt drives all of them. I mean, he sees all of these episodes as being anchored one way or another in, in, in states, even if non-state actors are also involved. In which case, then, the specificity of the present situation is less. This is a bit like you're arguing that the specificities of individual varieties of capitalism obscures this commonality. Well, he argues there's even a meta-commonality. Yeah. Do, you, do you find his basic argument about these cycles of um, accumulation of the real economy followed by financial accumulation based on debt. There is this kind of oscillation between these um, over the last three or four centuries. Yeah, it is uh, the second from Florence to Amsterdam to London uh, to US to New York. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting argument. It, it, uh, uh, however, I would say, and, <laughs> and that's again the, uh, my take on this, uh, what you see is, first of all, that each of these, of these episodes uh, ends with a formidable catastrophe. Right. The, the, and then the second is that, these, that the circuits in which this happens get larger and larger and larger. It's no longer just Tus Tuscany. It, it's no longer just the, the, uh, the Dutch uh, uh, Empire uh, or the British Empire. Uh, when the British Empire uh, collapsed in the, after the First World War, it was already a world affair. And uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, collapse of the, of the gold standard and, and the impossibility of finding an international monetary regime uh, in the 1930s that would have pacified the conflict between the capitalist nations, which resulted, among other things, in the disaster after 1939. So, so now it is even more integrated. Yeah. And now it's hard to see where the next, uh, where the next center is, is, is going to be, uh, or how difficult the transition from the one center to the next will be, uh, and, and whether uh, the dying uh, hegemon of the United States uh, will be able to make a deal with, let's say, China or other countries uh, for a joint administration of the transition to something else. I, uh, the, the very interesting uh, subject here is, is the, uh, the debates in the International uh, Monetary Fund about uh, a new uh, international exchange uh, currency, like uh, special drawing rights or whatever, which the United States are unable to accept because they need the dollar to be a world currency uh, for uh, domestic reasons. 
So, so yes, I, I think uh, Arigi has a very good point there, but one also has, has to see that this thing uh, sort of spreads from Tuscany uh, to the world and in, in 300 years, like a cancer or so. Do you want to just call on people or do you want me to say Yeah, no, I, I, can, I can do this, but, but I'm uh, distracted by, by the questions, so. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, vary it. In. Um, I was I was kind of surprised that you didn't feel comfortable making some sort of uh, interpretation of this graph at the end because based on the data you've shown, it seems that this story is quite consistent with a kind of return of the Rantier story, yeah, yeah. right? Where basically this decline in profit uh, in sort of profitable investment, basically that you have these uh, you know the, the sort of capitalist turning to debt as a source of, of revenue, basically extracting rent from people. So, I mean, it, how, how, why, why aren't you drawing that implication? No, I, I, I put this up uh, to, to make you um, interested in what I'm going to say tomorrow. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, I need to come back tomorrow. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, you, you are, no, what, what I find, uh, what, what I find uh, absolutely astonishing is how close today the sort of received wisdom uh, of the establishment uh, of some of the establishment economists comes to uh, uh, Marxist underconsumption theory. Yeah. It, it, they are be beginning to see that the extreme inequality of the distribution uh, sort of d d d d d d diminishes demand to a point that there is no uh, investment opportunities anymore, that they have to kick the money around between them, um, the bubbles all over the place, unpredictable. So, so Larry somehow says we have secular stagnation because we have, no, we have an excess of capital. Uh, um, inequality could be a contributing factor to this. Uh, and as a result, we will have financial bubbles all the time, which we can't, which we can't control. This is what now, uh, uh, what, what is now received wisdom. Um, looking at some of your data and your presentation, it sounds like you're making kind of an anti-institutionalist kind of argument, an, an argument against the varieties of capitalism view and against the economic sociology. Um, if, if that's the case, I would assume you're leaning towards some kind of a macro structural explanation, but I wasn't really able to see exactly what your what it was. Maybe. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, I I am under the impression uh, that uh, I'm, I'm, I've just seen too many similar things in too many countries. Yeah. Um, and I've seen, in addition, too much interdependence between them. The, Europe is now a really uh, hard case for interdependence because we have a common currency uh, run by a common central bank for uh, all these different countries that we used to treat like uh, uh, the, uh, the Mediterranean welfare state, the, the German welfare state, the French welfare state. So they are now under the same monetary regime. And uh, how much wiggling space they they still have under this regime is a really open question, uh, and 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 then and then you would say once once they have given up their uh, control over their over their money, uh, what else uh, uh, is there still for them to uh, to and and you see this in the southern uh, uh, in the Mediterranean European countries, which come in uh, okay in the 1980s I wrote a paper on the difficulties of other European countries to accept uh, the hard currency regime of the Bundesbank, the German Federal Bank, and the German, German Central Bank. Why? Because of their institutions, and also you can say of their habits, they needed uh, the capacity to once in a while deflate their currencies and then to uh, uh, revalue to devalue the currency in order to get their 
uh, economy going. This applied to France, it, it applied to Italy also. And they lived quite uh, well with it. There you could use an institutional explanation. Uh, let's say a, a big communist trade union, um, uh, small uh, export-oriented firms. The, you could tell all, all of these stories about this. Now, they don't have this uh, uh, instrument anymore. What is left? And what you see is that they are beginning, their governments are beginning to try to reform their institutions and the behavior of these economies so that they fit under the kind of German uh, uh, model, which I think is a disaster for, for them. But there comes an, an institution, this explanation again, I, I think for a very, very long time, uh, they will not be able to, to handle this. Uh, which, uh, again then, uh, means a shift in the class alliances in these, in these countries. The middle class is quite content with the new currency, because the middle class sort of buys uh, imported, uh, imported products, and, and they, they don't want uh, the price to increase uh, as, a, as a result of it of their currency. But people in the uh, sort of exporting uh, in industries, to the extent that they exist, have a very, very hard time. So yes, it, it mixes the structural and an institutional experience without uh, we being able to exactly say where's the, uh, where, where's the, 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 the difference between them. Yeah, you had your hand up. And then. Yeah, two questions, but I'm not sure. One is sort of trivial, which is that, um, when you said that they sounded like Marxists when they emphasize expanding markets and maintaining domestic markets, it's also Keynesian. I mean, it's sort of a, a mm -hmm. world in which Keynes, yeah. the blurred line between Keynesianism yeah. and Marxism has gotten more blurred. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm a little bit confused. Maybe this is something you want to talk about tomorrow. But I, I sort of thought that you were setting up the pressure from politi popular political pressure for social spending as sort of a straw man. Because in fact, what's really doing the action in this is the changing tax regimes. And you never actually, you, and in fact at one time you mentioned in passing the declining taxability of these countries. But you never actually talked about the politics behind the changing tax rules and who was pushing for it. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, now, in, in, in America, I, I mean, I, I realize in the Haven Center is, is a sort of enclave in the United States. In, in the United States, you basically have to argue that public choice uh, is, a, uh, is, is wrong. That, that's what, but you're all convinced that it is wrong, so, so, so I, I may, I may be strategically mistaken. No, it's good to us. But, but, but if you, if you, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the text thing actually comes in, but, the, but it is more complex, especially um, uh, if you, then first of all, it is clear that with the integration of the global financial sector, it becomes very easy to shift money from one place to the other. And this is big money. But then, democracy, so to speak, comes in in, an, in, an, in, an, in, in yet another way. Um, it is very easy, uh, in the global Norquist way, uh, to organize the middle class against taxation. And, and that also happens. So one of the first really tax rebellions was uh, in, the, in Denmark uh, in the early 1970s, where this one guy set up uh, a party that uh, immediately uh, commanded 15 or 20 percent of the vote, and it was about uh, lowering taxes. Uh, so, so, so that is in this image of the tax state. <coughs> It fits very nicely into this, because you have a society that is organized according to a mode of, let's say, possessive individualism. And then you have collective uh, demands in that society, and you have a permanent struggle between uh, uh, the collective and the, and the... Sweden, you would have always thought, Sweden was the world in which this, such a thing does not happen, because the Swedes are happy to pay 60% of their income to, to, to the state, because they get such wonderful social services, no longer. No longer. I've never seen a country uh, that uh, fast uh, divesting itself uh, of a traditional sort of high-tax uh, 
uh, social welfare regime. That, that's what it was. Yeah. So, so it's not just, and in, in California, it was the, it was this thing about the, 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 the yeah, the, the, the tax regime and, and. That was only property tax. Pro 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 yeah, property tax. But, but then the state sort of used property taxes to, uh, to extract, uh, they, that's it, they were happy with increasing property values. So, you, you go first. No. When you mentioned, that's okay. Uh, when you mentioned Sweden, I was thinking about uh, uh, Norway. Now they say that Norway is quite, or the consulate is quite happy with uh, these uh, economic situations there. Yeah. And it is probably because of the uh, oil yeah. production. And those Sweden have no potential in that possible area. And then also, um, I remember during the early, uh, the elder uh, Bush, when uh, the uh, market of the production was being funneled into narrower uh, hands. Farmers were going out of business, the small, business, small businesses were collapsing, and, and it was being gathered by one or two or three very large corporations. The, Norway is one of those countries that you actually have to exclude from any international comparison, be, 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 because they are basically an oil state, yeah, and 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 one that is very, uh, I mean, very well governed in in the sense that they are putting away much of the oil revenue into a national fund, uh, and and they, they are not spending it like like other places. Yeah, they they are really smart, uh, and 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 you can see the long term, let's say the long term effects of good government in these places, it doesn't go away immediately. It, it, uh, it's still there, but, but, but still, it's something like, it's something like uh, when you do what I did, uh, um, debt levels of countries, uh, then you, you know that the country like uh, Britain should have had higher debt levels in the 1980s and 1990s than they did. So Britain goes like this. Goes up and then suddenly long term and then yeah, but you have to look at the oil. Yeah. And they, this is an oil effect, and and then and now they are sort of back on on line. And it was yeah, but Margaret Thatcher has brought down the the next. <laughs> no, it was the oil, and and this is the same thing. As as far as the Sweden, Sweden, Swedish education system is good, yes, uh, that is still considered to be one of the very best in the world. Uh, uh, it's Scandinavia. We will see. We will see what happens if the, now the state has this has this idea. It's also very interesting that its citizens deserve more choice. That's how the story begins. So they should have access to private schools rather than just state schools. So let's have private schools. Private schools are being paid for by uh, uh, the government in the sense that uh, they get a budget for each student. Um, then um, the problem of regulation and supervision arises. Uh, the government will, has to make sure that these schools actually do what they're supposed to do in addition to making money because they are owned by private firms. And I tell you that if you look at this in a matter of 10, 15 years, you will see exactly the same regulatory problems that you have in a country like here, and you will have exactly the same sort of pressures as to whether they will get the same amount of money or more from the state than the others, whether you will have sort of quality. And now, now you can't have entrance exams, and they have to take whoever applies. 
but that is something that is also very much a subject of uh, uh, battles, uh, not necessarily in the legislature, but in the lobby. You, you understand what I mean? The, the, the moment uh, you make these shifts, it is not that it shifts in a matter of two years, but you are on the trajectory. So, yeah, yeah I, believe I mean, I believe we're starting to see the return of private investment capital to Greece, and I'm, I'm wondering what your perspective is on, is on that, and, and if that is going to be a model by which capitalism strives to, to sustain itself, this violent deconstruction, this violent what, re if yeah. you want to call it that, and this reinterpretation. So is Greece the end of the road? Is it the future, or is it both? Are we seeing something? Mm -hmm. I'd also be interested in uh, if you have any opinions on the Ukraine, the kind of competition for for resources and control and capital, and the idea that we're seeing these massive territorial readjustments and um, the deconstruction of, well, of of certain kinds of government governing structures. In the near and the questions like this, I like to answer by first saying that these things uh, take a long time. Yeah. And in between, there can be all sorts of contingent glitches, so to speak. So, uh, um, and, and then you have a particular bias in reporting on, on what happens. So, so now newspapers say, the Greek economy has grown by 0.5% last year. But you could also say it's still 20% below the most 2007. No, no, I, I know, I, I know, I, I know. But, but I, I just want to say these things are sticky and they move slowly. Usually, uh, you will have some investment. Uh, but my, uh, um, my model for this is, my, my sort of worst case scenario for this is, is Italy. Uh, Italy exists, it consists of two countries. One is Northern Italy, the other is Southern Italy. And they don't particularly like each other. Uh, and although they have a joint football team, that that's, keeps them together. But, but but if you go to Northern Italy, they will tell you um, that they had this view of Africa being, and not Europe, let's put it this way. And, and they will tell you the only question we have is, does Africa begin north of Rome or south of Rome? South of Rome. The, the, uh, the uh, radical state of north of Rome. Yeah? And, and in this country, you had a government of the left for, uh, let's say, four or, or of the center left uh, in the 1970s and, 19, uh, and 1980s. We had the Christian Democratic government that depended on the votes from the South. And they sent masses of, of money, regional aid, into the South. It basically didn't do much. The South is still a depressed area. Now, now then, then you can say, well, they have the mafia and, and all of these things. That's in part true. But there's more to it. Uh, I, I was very impressed with, uh, with a book by Thomas Piketty for the following reason. Uh, he is, I think, one of the first to confirm <laughs> what I think must be said very clearly, that in a market economy, the mechanism of cumulative advantage, those who have, uh, have a chance of uh, getting more, so to speak. Whereas those who don't have have a very, very hard time uh, to defend themselves against losing what they, what, what they have. And this built-in tendency for uh, divergence to grow, unless you have very good government political intervention to do this, then ask the question in, in Europe, who would be the agent who could do for uh, Greece what the Italian government could not do for Sicily and uh, uh, Basilicata and whatever this region. Who wears the aid? I think we have time for one more. And just to remind everybody, we have another session tomorrow and then a completely open forum discussion on Friday for all the issues we can't deal with. I think my question was prompted by something you said a few minutes ago, but I believe it connects with what we're talking about now. You said something to the effect of uh, the Southern European, the Mediterranean, 
that they're trying to reform to be compatible with the, re the regime that's required. He said one that's disastrous. Uh, so my question is, could you say a little more about what the disastrous consequences are that you see? And two, whether or not, it, even in principle, let alone in political reality, you see alternatives. Yeah. Uh, what, what is disaster? The the Greek uh, in the Greece public uh, health care system is now basically wiped out. Uh, wiped out because of uh, cuts in uh, public spending. Public spending cuts prescribed by the European Union as a condition for that. Uh, it's it's unimaginable if you live in Northern Europe. Uh, uh, to to hear and see how people who get sick in Greece, uh, uh, I have no access anymore to to anything that we would uh, consider decent healthcare. That that's something that I, I would call a disaster. Uh, in addition, uh, the European regime now, being, being the neoliberal regime that it is, uh, imposes on data countries that they reform the collective bargaining system so that you basically move from uh, uh, union-based uh, collective bargaining to individual uh, firms uh, determining uh, wages on the basis of, uh, of market. <coughs> and that, that, that is also uh, a disaster. I, I would think it, it, it backfires in, in the sense that now you, have a, you can have areas of high wage increases like if you destroy the Italian collective bargaining system, then the difference between the north and the south will explode even more than it is now. Um, I do think we have to stop. Um, <laughs>